Okay, so this second position I think is also quite interesting. Let's once again review the key factors and let's assess the position based on them. In the meantime, if you wish, you can pause the video once again and take a shot at evaluating this position before you continue the video. It's why to move. Okay, so let's run down through the factors. The first is king placement or king safety or otherwise material balance. I actually happen to prefer generally looking at material balance, so let's do that. There are seven pawns for white, and once again, four and seven for black. So we have equal material, the same number of rooks, and well, the minor piece distribution is two bishops for white and a bishop and a knight for black. So we might actually say that white has an advantage there. That's the first plus for white, the bishop pair. And notice also, if you understand, and this is a topic for another day, but the bishop pair is especially effective in open positions of an attacking nature. And so here we have kings on the opposite side of the board, no doubt that there are going to be possibilities to attack. And so the bishop pair is going to serve white very well, more than likely. The next factor to look at then is king safety. Whose king is safer? Well, in this particular case, we see that it's kind of unusual because White has moved both of his pawns, and black has not moved any of his pawns. So, at first sight, you might think that the black king should be safer. However, the thing is that this bishop is a long-range piece that serves a dual function. On the one hand, it's actually defending the white king. It's a fianchettled bishop. One of the useful things is that it's like adding more firepower to the defense. This is one of the reasons why it's a popular thing to place your bishop there. The other reason, of course, or one of the other big reasons being that this is the longest diagonal for the light-scored bishop. And in this case, he's fully exploiting this diagonal, pressuring c6 and b7, whereas black actually cannot create an attack with the minor piece that he has as his counterpart, right? They both have a dark-scored bishop, so it's this knight versus this bishop. But... The black knight is a short range piece and so it's just a sitting duck that is not at all involved in the attack. In addition, the pawns b4 and c4 can roll up the board extremely quickly and this is going to be allow white to first of all get the initiative and secondly just steamroll black especially along the light squares almost certainly because the bishop that white has that black does not have a counterpart for is the light squared bishop, the unopposed bishop. And if we notice, the king has three pawns as cover, but only one light squared pawn, holding those light squares together. So an attack along those light squares could be very, very powerful indeed. And we'll see that now in a second. So we can see that king safety is really a problem for black. When you consider these advanced pawns, this bishop that both defends the white king and attacks the black king and also pressures this knight on c6 and, of course, the possession of the bishop pair. So we can now move on to central control. Well, at first sight, it seems that black is winning that too. He has this pawn on d4. However, peace harmony, and I should perhaps include the stability of pawns and the harmony maybe not so much the harmony in terms of the placement, but especially stability of pawns is very important. So this particular pawn, it may be a central pawn, but as we'll see in a second, it's not very stable. So in fact, black has a type of central control that he's not so happy about. It can be very easily challenged. So we would say that at best, it's equal on that front, but actually white is very happy to have this ready-made target. In terms of the pawn structure, we can say that it's very similar. Both sides have a pretty healthy pawn structure, although once again, this pawn is a very easy target. In terms of space, white has a clear advantage of space on the queen side, whereas black has yet to mobilize his pawns. In terms of initiative, it's white to move, and he will actually be beginning with an immediate threat, so he will be getting the initiative. And in terms of open lines, well, there is certainly a fight along the d-file, and some lines may get opened on 
the queen side. So in both cases, the pressure on the D file is in white's favor. And any lines, of course, that open up on the queen side is going to favor white because the black king is there. So all in all, we've run down through the factors and hopefully it's apparent now that white is doing very well indeed. So let's see what happened. White played b5, attacking the knight, and black dropped the knight back to e7. Now notice the d4 pawn is less well defended now, and the black king safety has been reduced in the absence of this knight on c6. White now plays e3. He exploits the pin along the d file, and actually forces black's hand. He cannot play d takes e3 because the queen falls, and he has two options here. He can either advance the pawn, which is what he did, or he can try and hang on to the pawn with the move knight f5. But the problem with this move is that after the move c5, white actually increases the pressure on the d4 pawn. Black could continue with a move like, let's say, rook to e8, just sort of hoping to hang on to the pawn, saying, well, you're attacking it with one, two, three, four pieces, but I'm also, you know, defending with one, two, three, four pieces, so I should be okay. However, the problem is that there is another threat that white had, and that is the move bishop takes b7. Cracking open those light squares on the queen side of king takes bishop, then c6, check, is game over. So we see really some very serious problems and how to defend against this threat. Well, you could play a move such as queen to c8, but then in this case, e takes d4, and now you cannot take this pawn on d4, so you have lost material. So therefore, knight f5 is actually not a very good idea, and black should instead go for d3. However, this would create a fork in the road. White now has two very interesting and promising continuations. The first is the more positional continuation. Bishop takes f6. After g takes f6, we see that the pawn structure for black has been completely ruined. White could also now isolate this pawn on d3. Notice it's on a light square, and this bishop right here is the unopposed light squared bishop. Very, very strong piece. So after something like rook to d2, queen f5, queen b3, notice the pressure on that pawn. Now rook c1, a little bit of a subtle move. The straight up attack against d3 was a little bit less accurate. And now after, let's say a few moves, just for illustrations, c5, rook e6, rook c3. Notice ganging up on the three pawn while simultaneously trying to press forward and attack against the black king. Knight to c8, a4, h5, a5, h4, g4, queen e5, and now c6. Notice that white basically just chose to gang up on the d3 pawn, forcing the black pieces to simply have to defend the pawn and from very particular squares, especially the queen. Notice the point is that even though white is attacking with three pieces, the queen is also eyeing up the c5 pawn. So in this particular configuration, if white were to capture the pawn, then after rook takes d3, rook takes d3, queen takes c5, black would be very happy to have traded his weak pawn on d3 for the quite useful strong pawn on c5. But of course, white, instead of such a plan, he can simply, in this position, continue with a5 and an assault on the black king. If, let's say, h4 happens, then g4, white prevents any kind of destruction of his pawn cover. Black would step his queen away, queen to e5. And here, white is already crashing through with a move like c6. One illustrative line is if b6, a takes b6, a takes b6, and white here can play the clever move queen to a4 with dual threats, and there is simply no, no adequate defense. Black can try to move queen takes c3 anyway, and after queen a6, play knight d6. But following rook a2, queen a8, is threatened and there is no good defense here. So it'll be checkmate in a few moves. 
So therefore, this is the direction of bishop takes f6. A very, very strong idea. So first of all, you ruin the black kingside structure. And secondly, you go hunting for the d3 pawn. And additionally, you combine it with an assault on the black king. And notice the way that white crashed through on the light squares, which should come as no surprise because white has that unopposed light squared bishop. The other approach, just as good if not better, is to move bishop to d4. And this uses a tactical point. If bishop takes d4, of course, the threat is queen takes a7. And after bishop takes d4, white, of course, is not going to capture here with the pawn, since after queen takes d4, he is down a pawn. But instead, he would play rook takes d3. And the idea is that the bishop cannot move because of the pin. Now we have a situation where white is up a pawn, but of course down a piece. The piece will be recovered, but and it will be recovered in full, unless black does takes quite drastic measures and plays a move such as knight to f5, trying to preserve that material advantage. The problem is things get worse for him. After e takes d4, knight takes d4, we see that now the knight is pinned. So white will simply play rook f to d1. And there are only two ways of addressing the threat of rook takes d4. The first is c5. And the second is knight e2 check. Let's take a look at knight e2 check first. White just goes king h2. And here the black queen is under attack. Queen takes d3. Uh, rook takes d3. Rook takes d3 is met by the move queen c2. Now you're attacking the rook and the knight, which uses, well, what is this factor? It's piece placement or piece stability. And we see that black's pieces have lost all sort of coordination and stability in a sequence that arose from just trying to preserve material. But the root of it was right here when white played bishop to d4 and targeted this weak pawn. So. Then we saw rook takes d3, knight f5, pawn takes, knight takes. And now after rook d1, we see this line exists with knight e2 and eventually capturing the rook. And of course, it fails due to queen c2. But it's very, always very important to notice where the roots of a particular problem actually are and then try to fix that problem at the root rather than just seeing the isolated case. Anyway, after rook fd1, black plays the move pawn to c5, now b takes c6, and if b takes c6, simply rook takes d4 is game over. I should have pointed out actually that in the event of knight e2, king h2, black could instead go queen c8. But here white can once again take advantage of the instability of the knight on e2. The simplest way forward is queen c2. The knight being a short range piece is simply unable to escape. Rook takes d3, rook takes d3, rook e8, defending the knight, but simply bishop f3, ganging up on the knight further. Now there is no way for black to escape with the knight. Every square is covered by the more well-coordinated pieces. The white position is clearly more harmonious. So therefore black could defend with the move queen to e6, defend that knight a second time, but unfortunately this fails. After bishop takes e2, queen takes e2, queen takes e2, rook takes e2, it would appear that black has gone away with murder and has managed to solve that problem that happened a very long time ago when white played e3, and after d3, bishop d4, and went after that liability, that weakness. But unfortunately, there's one key factor in this position, and that is his king safety. He has problems here with the back rank. And so white, of course, will play rook d8, and it's game over. Therefore, if we go back, this was the original position, and we saw how quickly things fell apart for black. After b5, we see a combination of an attack on the king in certain variations with c5 and lines like bishop takes b7. And after knight e7, we see this other problem in the black position, which is this unstable pawn on d4 is 
subjected to an attack and after d3 a tactical idea bishop d4 wins the pawn and otherwise bishop takes f6 would ruin the black pawn structure and still then later on go after and successfully coral this d3 pawn. So in fact the white position here to begin with can be evaluated as winning for white and with correct play it's quite straightforward to convert to get the full point in a tournament situation. Okay so that is game two and I shall see you in game three.